Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA. Mm. A very warm welcome to all of you here at our premises in central Dublin and to those joining online. We're really happy to be joined today by Aoife Moore, an award-winning journalist and author who has been generous enough to take the time to be with us at what is a very busy time. Aoife, as ever, is going to speak to us for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then this will be followed by the all-important questions and answers with you here at headquarters and those of you online. As ever, those of you who are here, you might raise your hand. Those online, please use the questions and answers function on Zoom. And a reminder, the meeting today is on the record. I'll now formally introduce Aoife and then hand things over to her. Aoife Moore is an award-winning journalist and the author of The Long Game, Inside Sinn Féin. Aoife is a former political correspondent for the Sunday Times and the Irish Examiner and she spent two years working as a journalist for Press Association. In 2020, as we'll all remember, Aoife broke the Golfgate story on the Oireachtas Golf Society scandal, along with her colleague Paul Hosford, for which they were jointly awarded Journalist of the Year at the 2021 News Brands Irish Journalism Awards. Congratulations both. A Derry native, Aoife has written and commented extensively on Northern Ireland, Irish and Northern Irish politics, the legacy of the Troubles and the Good Friday Agreement as well as the unique challenges faced by women in Irish journalism and more widely in Irish society. Aoife has recently launched a new podcast dubbed Trolls about life online and her own experience of online abuse. And Aoife was just telling me that that's been rolled out in some primary schools, which is, uh, which is really cool and really interesting. Also delighted to announce that, as some of you know already, Aoife is going to be taking over the important role of BBC Dublin correspondent starting this Monday. So huge, huge congratulations to Aoife for that. But indeed, the warmest of welcomes, and the next 20 minutes is yours. Thanks, Aoife. Grace. Hello. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I do better with questions rather than formal speeches. So I'll just do this. I'll keep this short and then we can go into questions. But for those who don't know me or anything about me, my name is Aoife Murr. I'm from Derry City. Um, I am from a family directly impacted by the troubles or the conflict in, in Northern Ireland. So my uncle Patrick was the same age as I am now when he was shot in the back by Soldier F um, and killed on Bloody Sunday. He was a civil rights uh, activist and he had six children uh, when he was killed. Our family became one of the founding families of the Bloody Sunday Justice Campaign, which took 39 years for the British government to admit that it was unjustified and, and unjustifiable. And that experience, now my uncle Paddy died 19 years before I was born, but the experience of growing up around the campaign, the protests, the press conferences, and also this unbuilt questioning of everything the authority is telling me, I don't really think I could have done any other job <laughs> when I grew up, but it was a great grounding for, there is such, especially in Derry City, an innate, feeling of right and wrong and that fight for justice. And that really was what inspired me um, to become a journalist. And I think naturally um, Northerners, I have to say this without saying color of full language, but Northerners have a, a great radar for um, saying it like it is. And I think in politics, we are really missing that a lot of the time. Um, people are very duplicitous, they can be very false. And it, it really excludes people from vulnerable communities because the language that's we use is so unapproachable. And when I moved to the Republic, I was taken aback because I had never lived in the Republic. I went from Derry to Glasgow and then came here. And I came to the Republic with this very naive view that I had no family connections to any political party. My family aren't political. I'm the first person in my family to go to university. I didn't feel like I was due any abuse. And I was taken aback at the sheer level of vitriol that I was uh, that was directed towards me because I was from the north. Not only that I was from the north, but I was from the north. I was Khalifa. I was from Derry, and my uncle was murdered by the British Army. So that was what most people took from that: is that she supports Sinn Fein. There's no other. There's no other way forward. She must support Sinn Fein because look at her background. And what I kept finding as I spoke to more people, and I am not saying people in the street, I am talking about the people who walk the halls in Leinster House, the ignorance about people in the North, the ignorance about the troubles. 
And what I find really disappointing is that the Irish government, whoever is in power, will always hold up the Good Friday Agreement as the best thing that this island has ever done, because it is. But the lack of education about your cousins in the north really offends me, and it makes for a very poisonous, divisive uh, political debate. We have had, you know, elected politicians calling out for, you know, people's bodies to be found who have been buried 10 years before. We had a column in a major newspaper last week where they blamed the IRA for a bomb that was done by ISIS. There is a serious lack of education. And the reason that I felt this book was so necessary now was because on both sides, whether people vote for Sinn Féin or they don't like Sinn Féin, there is so much ignorance about where Sinn Féin came from and who they are. And my other concern would be the more popular that Sinn Féin became, it's the victor who gets to write the history. And I did not feel there was a good contemporary modern book about how Sinn Féin are and how they are run. I knew when I was going under this that I was going to have my work cut out, but I did very much feel like I was the best person, best place to write the book. Because I, as I often said, when I took the job with the Sunday Times, I think I might be the only person who worked for Rupert Murdoch who had to walk past two IRA monuments to get to school. So I grew up in a very Republican estate in Derry. And I had known people who were in prison for IRA crimes my entire life. That's not very strange for where I'm from. I have a group of about 10 best friends who I all went to school with in the old Gary school. And every single one of us has a family member who was in the IRA. That's where we come from. So I felt that I had the base knowledge and the context and the contacts to write this book and do it well. Um, for those who haven't read the book or, or bought the book, um, the first person I told about the book uh, was Mary Lou MacDonald. She seemed pleased. She seemed happy for me. We had a good working relationship. I believe she said no better woman, which I agree. Um, and she said she would tell Pearson Michelle. And I asked her about a cooperation. What happened then and in the time since, um, the way I've come to describe it is unhelpful at best, obstructive at worst. Sinn Féin wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. Within weeks of sending repeated emails, they sent me, a, I got an email from their solicitor telling me that they wanted to see parts of the book. Um, they wanted it to see extracts of the book about allegations that were made against staff and members and, and whoever else. So naturally, um, being the dairy woman that I am, I didn't reply and printed the email out and it's now on the second page of the book. Um, and I'm not going to lie, this was not an easy process. I took it very personally. There was a lot of tears. Uh, my character was questioned repeatedly by people I thought I knew and had good working relationships with. I was given a very insulting nickname um, by a staff member in Sinn Féin who called me the poison snake. And the book that I have written, I have to say, no, it is absolutely not perfect. I don't think any book that's written about Irish politics is, but it is, I do not think anyone else could have written this book just to the nature of I wouldn't be stopped and I already knew too many people and I think that's why Sinn Féin were so paranoid. Um, the book touches on everything from it comes from the hunger strike up until repeal the 8th and now like we saw yesterday the most popular party on this island and I really wanted to chart how that happened and who the base are and what comes next and I think really what comes next for Sinn Féin is going to be the most interesting thing because I've often said that I feel like Sinn Féin are walking a, a tightrope. There is the Sinn Féin who have the hunger strike commemorations and we need to remember that the hunger strike is so important to Republicans. That's where the Sinn Féin that we know now, that's where they come from. That's the election of Bobby Sands. That's everything for them. What happens then if Mary Lou MacDonald becomes the Taoiseach? You know, some of the people who died on hunger strike committed horrific crimes. Can the Taoiseach of Ireland still go to hunger strike commemorations? And we are already seeing some questions about whether Mary Lou Macdonald would do that. She hasn't given a definitive answer, but that in itself is a message that there might be a change. There might have to be a change. So for me, I don't really make a point in the book whether I think they're the greatest party in the world or the worst party in the world. That's not for me. It's not for a journalist, a political correspondent to make. But I tried to lay out 
everything. And the big thing for me was victims because the thing that bothers me a lot about politics in the Republic is the Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael mostly politicians consistently talk about IRA victims, but they're not actually talking about victims. They are only talking about IRA victims when it comes to slagging off Sinn Féin. So in each chapter, or if I'm describing each attack, I'll pick one victim in the book and describe and give that person a personality and a whole life and a profile. My uncle Paddy was murdered and I knew exactly what he looked like. We had framed pictures of him all over our house. There's a mural point painted in the bog side with his face on it. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know he was a great singer. I didn't know he was a big drinker. I didn't know he was really good fighting. <laughs> that sort of stuff. So I went out of my way because I'm very sick of people talking about the victims of the troubles, but not talking about the victims of the troubles. So each person, or each in each chapter, there is a person that I pick out. So it can be, you know, a census worker, a young woman who was shot in the head out doing the census. It could be uh, an Asian woman whose husband was left so disabled and injured by a bomb in Canary Wharf that she killed herself in her 50s. These are the voices and the, and the stories that are forgotten and I think we would all do well to stop using victims of the troubles in general, no matter who took their lives um, to be used as fodder um, to get one up on their political opponents. So in saying that, the reaction to the book has been uh, overwhelmingly, I would say, good. I mean, not from within Sinn Féin, but the, um, the reviews have been great and I'm very happy. I knew I wasn't going to please everyone with this book. I think I don't think I can could you picture a more divisive topic in Ireland at the moment than a possible Sinn Féin government? But I think I did the best I could and I am proud of the book. Um, I think what happens now and even with the, the amount of people here and the amount of people watching is there is a real interest in this now. People, Sinn Féin are likely going to be in government north and south. And the next big question is how they manage that. They have not ever been in charge of a government like they would be in the Republic, you know, it's not something I would say, but Stormont has been referred to as a glorified council, a city council. So it's also a government where you're there in government with their sworn enemies and the people that, and like the SDLP and Alliance. So they will, I am certain, have to go into coalition. And I know my Hall Martin doesn't like to hear it, but I think it will be with Fianna Fáil. And I think they have made so many promises now as a modern party that they will struggle to keep by the very nature of how Ireland is set up um, with FDI and everything else. But I think the most interesting thing for me and the real marker of who Sinn Féin are is what we are going to see now coming if they get into government, how they react to the Republican base, how they react to their history. You know, we saw Michelle O'Neill at uh, the Queen's funeral. I wasn't surprised by that, but a lot of people were. But I think if you watch how Sinn Féin have carried themselves since Martin McGuinness met the Queen, there are all these extensions of olive branches. There are all this, this outreach, but it is all masking a much darker shadow of how the party still operates and how there are still a lot of things that happened under the eyes of people within Sinn Féin or previously were in Sinn Féin that haven't been accounted for. So that to me is the much more interesting question and how Republicanism stands side by side with this new progressive left-wing party that they claim to be. I think, and I use this as an example, but Bobby Story's funeral is the best example I can give of that. So in the Republic, when Bobby Story's funeral happened and there was all those pictures on every front page in the middle of COVID with the leaders of Sinn Féin at, at the funeral and people in the Republic kept saying to me, why would they do that? Like, that is so silly. They've just walked into this huge controversy for no real reason. Surely they would know. And then when I interviewed people for the book, I was told, yeah, we did know. We knew that was going to happen, but we could not risk losing the base in West Belfast because we didn't go to Bobby's story funeral. So these are the things that they are going to have to get a handle on because it's going to come up consistently and it is not something you can't take a stand on when you're Taoiseach. And I do really believe that Mary Lou McDonald is going to be the Taoiseach. Um, so that's all I have to say about the book now. And I'm happy now to go to questions. Is that all right? Thank you.